thank you, Leanne, and thank you to the entire committee for uh, giving me the honor of speaking tonight and being the, being the first to go. Welcome to you all, and I hope you appreciate my talk. As Leanne said, I've always been big into math since I was a kid and into voting for the last 15 years. So reality TV shows are all fun and games, but when it comes time for something serious like the election of a president, math and using math to, to model results and make predictions and also to influence voting is really, really important and really interesting and was used quite a bit in this past election. So whether it be reality TV or pre presidential elections, some people have a favorite person they like, whether it's a singer or dancer or a candidate, and others are more ambivalent. They're undecided. So we'll see how undecided voters are maybe given some, some influence by the political campaigns. So first of all, some people, some, there we go, some voters are never going to change their mind. They like a candidate, and they're going to be fits on that candidate throughout the entire campaign. That, that candidate can say, say whatever they want to say, do whatever they, ever want, whatever they want to do, and they'll have the support of you. But not everyone feels that way. Some people are partly malleable. Some are very malleable to, to change. Some people are very ambivalent and go back and forth. Others are undecided until the day before the election when they have to pick person A or person B. So most people are like this. They may think in the last election, I might vote for Obama, but maybe, maybe Romney, and something may happen which will change my mind. So what can change someone's mind in terms of voting for a candidate in a big presidential election? Well, various things could happen. Maybe their running mate says something stupid. It's happened before. It'll happen again. Maybe the economy can go up or down. In 2008, when the economy tanked, John McCain's campaign was doomed. How about a war? Well, a war is tricky. A war that's going well can help a candidate who's an incumbent. A war that's not going well can be his downfall. But what else is out there? How about a speech? A, a speech or a debate. Sometimes speeches and debates rile up your fan base and they're kind of preaching to the choir. They really don't change that many votes. How about negative campaigning? Those flyers that say this person did something really bad. Well, whether it's true or not, and whether people like him or not, which they generally say they don't like him, they actually do work. Studies have shown that negative campaigning does work, and therefore it's done, and it'll be done until a study shows that it doesn't work. So again, we have a lot of things that go on that can influence someone's voting pattern. How about those robocalls when Obama calls your house on a recorded message? If you're an Obama fan, probably like, oh, he's calling me. That's great. I want to hear his voice. If you don't support him, you're like, oh, not him again. I want to get rid of him as soon as possible. So these kind of things can be really tricky. Usually they rile up um, your, your, your base, but don't really change that many minds. So campaigns have to figure out what does change your mind. What can a candidate say or do to change your mind? So we have a lot of issues here with, with bringing math into all this, mathematical modeling, and in terms of how information that's acquired from a campaign can be used to influence how they market to you. Now again, you have things like the Electoral College in the national election. So na even the national election for president, there's very local aspects to it, local campaigning, local key buzzwords they'll use here in South Florida they won't use elsewhere, like Medicare, retirees. So how can you mathematically model, put all these variables in a model, and output something that can actually be helpful to not only predict what could help or hurt a candidate, but who may win or lose an election on election day. So this past year, something was, was put into action that was my moment of insight. I always had an interest in math and in politics and statistics, and seeing it all used in a logical way that worked was fantastic. So Larry Grizzolano, one of Obama's campaign managers, developed what's called the optimizer. He had a bunch of very talented mathematicians, statisticians from top Wall Street Ivy League areas, and had them model what would or would not help the president in his electoral campaign. So they went around and asked people questions. They talked to people saying, how do you plan to vote on election day? And based on what they said, they asked them a series of follow-up questions. If Obama came out in support of gay marriage, would that help or hurt his, can his cause with you? If he came out in favor of ending the war in Iraq, would that come help or hurt your view of him? So a series of if, and, or but questions can kind of tie together with correlation analysis who is likely to be voting for Obama or not come election day and what he can say or do nationally or locally that will change your mind. 
So the, he was a mastermind, but he had a whole team of people out there helping him develop this model and refining it throughout the election process to the point where by election day they were so confident they were going to win, they didn't even bother watching the returns. So here's what he did. He said, I want to maximize eyeballs. I want to, I, I want to um, get people out there and get their attention by advertising on certain TV shows. So we all saw political ads this year all the time on, on TV. Well, in the, in the traditional model, in years past, most campaigns focus on areas they thought were going to help them achieve the, the, uh, the goal of getting the largest audience who was planning to vote as possible. So the traditional thought was that you would, you would campaign during uh, primetime TV hours, during primetime news, the CBS Evening News, the ABC Evening News. Because those people are gonna, tend to be older and plan to vote and are knowledgeable enough to pay attention to a campaign ad. Things like Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune, those primetime game shows, generally attract an audience which is more intelligent, more uh, literate in political uh, activity, and more likely to be influenced by a certain political campaign ele electoral um, ad. But Obama's team figured out that these were, yes, reaching a lot of people, a lot of eyeballs, a lot of very intelligent, a lot of very savvy voters who planned to vote. The problem was most of these folks watching these shows were not going to change their mind. These are folks who had their mind made up by the time the primary elections were over and all the campaigning on earth was not going to change their vote. So rather than campaign on the 6 to, 6 to 10 p.m. time slot on the major channels, they decided to go elsewhere, try to find those people who are planning to vote, they're patriotic enough, they want to vote, but they have really no idea what they're doing. They're not sure who they want to vote for, why they want to vote with that person. They just want to vote because that's the cool thing to do. So who do they seek out? Who do they target? So they went to new places. They found that TV land, Hallmark Channel, folks were watching alternative programming at night, like the Golden Girls, and friends, <laughs> tended people who were trying to avoid watching debates, watching political stuff. They wanted to avoid that in their little, little cocoon here, but yet getting their attention with the ads did help. ESPN, getting the daytime and nighttime male voter who was planning to vote but really wasn't sure what he, what he, who he wanted to vote for, ESPN was a nice place to, to capture that vote. Food Network, trying to get the mother at home with her kids or someone who just, uh, a woman who's during the daytime watching TV to learn how to cook, but while it's on, watching a little t political ad, seeing Obama shake hands with some women voters. And then late night, traditionally, they thought, well, we want to go toward the J John Stewart or Stephen Colbert. But those, again, were people who were pretty sad. They were not going to change their idea, change their vote. They went to some new sources, Jimmy Kimmel and Julie, Jimmy Fallon, that young 20 or 30 hipster college student who planned to vote but really wasn't sure what they were doing. That was who they were targeting with the optimizer, trying to get those eyeballs, those folks watching their message over and over again until they voted for their side. And sure enough, it worked. Obama was, was re-elected fairly handily, and the math did match the results. Mathematicians like, like Nate Silver predicted perfectly the exact electoral college outcome to a T. So what else happened here? Again, this happened in the last election cycle. It'll happen again, and even more so in, in four to eight years. Things like internet campaigns, Facebook. So if you signed up for Facebook on Obama's team, he had your information. He had not only your information, but also your friend's information, how to contact them. So if you're in Florida and your friend in California had you on their friends list and he was an Obama supporter, you get an, e an email through Facebook saying, hi, I'm Barack Obama. I see that your friend in California has, is, is my friend. And I want to remind you that voting in Florida, early voting starts tomorrow in your area, so go vote. So a lot of these reminders help people get to the polls, in, in especially early voting states like Florida, to get out there and vote early. Also, internet campaigns, email messages, automated messages, all those tended to work pretty well. So here's the Electoral College uh, map, as well as the map of dollars and, and uh, time spent in certain states. So you can see here that Florida is a very popular place in election time because the state's very divided among the two parties and they want to get those large chunk electoral votes from Florida. This is back from uh, 2004, the map at the top, so it's a little bit outdated, but states like Ohio and Pennsylvania, Wisconsin are primarily those states they want to target to get those electoral votes. Nowadays, even North Carolina and Virginia have been in play with the rise of retirees in North Carolina and government workers of Virginia, making those states less red and more blue. But you can see some states have not been and will not be targeted by campaigns in the near future because they're in areas which are entirely blue 
or entirely red, such as Utah for the red and Vermont for the blue. So the question is, where do we go from here? Well, mathematics is not going away. Mathematics is important. Mathematics is, uh, is, is, is insight into anything. For me, it's voting. For you, it might be everything from going to the grocery store or watching your favorite sports team. But mathematics is involved in all aspects of life. And in this case, modeling using various things like Markov change to predict the probability of voting for a candidate in November, initially voted for, they would vote for a candidate as of today, and we would change that mind each step in the way. That's a Markov chain, a mathematical model for predicting the future based on today's events. Whether it's economics or politics, it still applies. Optimization, optimizing the maximum number of votes they can get in a certain area or a certain time frame based on their, um, the amount of money and time spent in those areas. So this will not change. In 2014, 2016, it will not change. My prediction is that it will change in the fact that candidates will be more younger, hipper, as opposed to older candidates who maybe seem out of touch. It might be the, the Facebook, Twitter generation. They'll have candidates who look like in our age group more and more as time goes forward. And they'll use the same modeling and predictive modeling to base the campaigns on maximizing votes in the same manner. So I think this insight is not only practical now, it'll be practical in two, four years and beyond. Thank you.